Good morning, my friends. Grim here. I hope all is well, and welcome to another 10-minute deck tech in the lovely pre-modern format. This one features mono green Ponza. If you're coming from modern like I am, you know what a Ponza deck is conceptually. It is acceleration into land destruction, and then you find ways to either double down on that land destruction to totally lock your opponent out from playing their cards, or you find very powerful threats to end the game before they can recover from being set off curve. The structure of Ponza decks in pre-modern, conceptually similar, but in terms of the actual cards, absolutely mind-blowing to me. And there's a million different ways to play Ponza in this format. This is merely one of them. Thank you so much, my friends, for tuning in. I do appreciate the views and, of course, everybody supporting the content in any way they choose to. It means a lot to me. So without any further ado, thanks again for watching. And let's get into a deck tech on Mono Green Ponza in pre-modern. All right, guys. So the first question to answer is why mono green. Perhaps red green is the most obvious way to build Ponza. You get access to more land destruction spells than any one color can give you, including very powerful and flexible ones like Pillage. You get a faster clock in most ways and better board control, and that's not even counting the various different ways to play red green there's so many different variants and it's not even getting into the prospect of black based land destruction which is very real in this format so why mono green well as usual with mono color decks the land base is an asset and pre-modern it's difficult sometimes to even get consistent mana and color production when splashing a single color so when you stick to a mono colored plan you've got all kinds of consistency and all kinds of power as a general rule given the poor quality of the dual lands in this format and the extreme quality of the utility lands look no further than four copies each of wasteland and rashad and port to begin i don't think i need to explain just how powerful those are in a land destruction shell. Two copies of Treetop Village are actually a very crucial win condition in a deck like this. And, of course, good old basic forest times 12. We have opted for the UK Eurolands here, which seemed like a home for our elves. That was realistic enough, but also there's kind of this sense of ancient power that could well hide something much larger, like the Argothian Worm, but onto the spells, my friends. Four Lanoir Elves, four Findhorn Elves, absolutely love to see it. You're gonna juke people into thinking you're playing Elves half the time on turn one. Very nice psychological edge when they're just kind of prepared to stem a flood of the pointy ears, and then boom, turn two, their land gets blown up. Anyway, these of course can turn sideways to help end the game, but their primary role is to power out turn two land destruction, turn two tangle wire, and indeed just generally help you cast your spells. Double spelling in the mid game is very, very nice. And when you're talking about the symmetry of effects like smokestack and tangle wire, the fact that they're relatively expendable late game has its upsides as well. Wall of Roots times four is a great blocker, great synergy even with the elves in that on turn two, you can play the wall, immediately put a counter on it and cast a one drop and just really explode out of the gates. Wall of Roots also extremely synergistic in many other ways in the deck, but basically it's a defensive card that ramps you. Living Wish times two. This is certainly not mandatory in my opinion, but it is very, very nice to have access to all kinds of effects. And I'm going to jump over to the sideboard here to talk about the wishboard targets before we move on to the meat of the deck, because we are not really hedged against much of anything, and that is because between Creeping Mold, which is a very flexible spell, and Living Wish's uh, tutor aspect, we don't really have to be. There's no main decking Naturalize or anything like that. So we have Scragnoth, a 3-4 for 5, can't be countered, Pro Blue, this is your control killer. We've got Phantom Centaur, protection from black, and a very interesting 
wall of text that basically amounts to the fact that if people are trying to point burn spells at it or attack it to death, you have to kill it three times. Nantuko Vigilante is naturalized on a body, and Deranged Hermit is your grindy bomb at the top end. So a very modest wish board, all things considered, in terms of the number of slots that are dedicated to it, but very flexible, very well balanced, and gives you an out to a wide variety of unusual situations. Thermokarst and Winter's Grasp are your primo land destruction spells. Winter's Grasp, a green stone rain with a slightly more demanding casting cost. And Thermokarst, the same thing functionally. Nobody really playing Snowlands except for style points in pre-modern. And if they do, you're punishing them by gaining a life. Creeping Mold times three gives us a critical mass of land destruction effects for those types of progressions where you're just going turn one dork, turn two land destruction, turn three land destruction, and really putting the hammer to the opponent. But of course, it can take down artifacts or enchantments. Very, very nice one at the top end of the land destruction suite here. And consider our Gothian Worm at the very end of that curve. It is a 6-6 six, six trample for four which is absolutely off the charts in terms of value for the cost in pre-modern as far as aggressive bodies go. When Argo or blah, 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 excuse me, when Argothian Worm, there we go, enters the battlefield, any player may sack a land. If a player does, it goes back on the top of its owner's library. But of course, if all is going to plan, your opponent will not be able to sacrifice a land or they'll be totally unwilling to, putting them in a no-win situation. Tangle Wire is absolutely insane in many decks, including ones I've featured here like Mud and Elves, and we have the Elves to facilitate early Tangle Wires and a high permanent count to make sure we're still functional while the opponent is not. Special shout out to Wall of Roots, who can very easily tap to Tangle Wire, as it can very easily tap to itself, neither card losing efficacy. Wall of Roots, of course, can still produce mana, in fact, twice before you get another turn, once on your turn and once on the opponent's turn if necessary, which is especially useful for activating Rishidan Port or a defensive treetop village on your opponent's turn. Smokestack times three is very nice. It's a big, big knockout punch. However, this deck doesn't necessarily play that well from behind sometimes, and Smokestack is absolutely emblematic of that, because your own Smokestacks can bury you if you aren't sufficiently burying the opponent before it hits the field. So this is our big KO. It's very difficult to recover from once it gets going, but only a three of because it is definitely on the wrong side of symmetrical if you're not already doing your thing. Stunted Growth at the top end is one of the spicier inclusions and one of the ones that really made me take a look at this list in particular. That said, I'm not sure whether we can consider it win more or not. It's basically lights out and it's not symmetrical unlike Smokestack, but if you're in a position where Stunted Growth is A, castable, aka you have five mana, B, it resolves, and C, your opponent already has three or more cards in hand, you're probably already winning anyway. That said, it's a very spicy piece of tech and a very powerful effect in the right circumstances. I just love how clean and balanced this list is, my friends, and the sideboard is no exception. In addition to the four wishboard targets I listed, I missed a couple. There's a Mastacore as well, and a Dust Bowl. Remember, Living Wish can pick up lands as well. This is an excellent target in the deck for obvious reasons. And then there are three sets of three ofs to round things out, each of which have very obvious use cases. Naturalize gives you not only quick interaction against artifacts and enchantments, but a critical mass of that alongside Creeping Mold post side. Phyrexian Furnace for a value neutral or sometimes value positive way to hate out the opponent's graveyard. And Hidden Gibbons against Sly, against Control, against anyone else trying to cast a lot of instants. You're getting a 4-4 four, four for one. Seems good. Well, thank you once again for watching, my friends. Appreciate each and every view. Let me know in the comments below how you like to play Ponza. Again, it is one of the most customizable archetypes with a huge variety, not only of technologies and strategies to be employed, but colors as well. The sky's the limit with Ponza in this format, and I'd love to hear your take on this list and on the archetype as a whole. 
Thanks again for watching. Thank you for supporting this content. And I will see you for the next 10-minute deck tech in pre-modern. Take care.